Well, good morning, and thanks for every, everybody for joining us. Thanks for dropping by. Anybody fly to get here? There you go. And we're going to work very hard, not only in this program, but in the two later on today. Hopefully, everybody's staying or not, not to put you to sleep. And if you keep both eyes open and straight ahead, you should leave smiling. Oh. Yeah, we hope that you like what you see and have lots to tell your friends about. As Shoshana said, if you have a question, please hold it to the end of the program. We'll have about 15 minutes for programs. This program is about intermediate telephoto lenses. For the last 20, 25, 6, 27 years, I've been using Canon Big Glass. Originally the old 800-5.6 manual focus, then the 600 f4, then the 800-5.6 autofocus, and then now the 600 f4, and I use both teleconverters all the time. So when folks see a picture like this, it's always the same story. Oh, if I had a big lens like Arthur Morris, I could take pictures just like that, blah, blah, blah. So I'll have the 600 with the 2x, and I'll say, here, why don't you put a card in here, and let's see what you can do. So then they go, after about two minutes, they go, uh, can you help me find the bird in the viewfinder? <laughs> Not to mention that you have to design a pleasing image, get the exposure right, wait for the perfect head angle, and yada, yada, yada. So one of the offers I like to make folks is, hey, I got a great idea. You got a 300 Nikon, which I don't know how to use, and I have a 600 Canon with the 2X. Why don't you take pictures with my gear all morning, and I'll take pictures with your little crappy lens, whatever it is, a 300 millimeter, and then we'll go to McDonald's and pick our three best pictures and take 10 people online and see who's got the best pictures, and whoever wins keeps the other guy's gear. <laughs> so you see this picture and you think, oh my god, long lens. But making good photographs of birds or anything else is about seeing a good situation. 70 to 200 f4. This close, you know, focusing to one and a half, two meters uh, at Green K wetlands on the east coast of Florida, not you know, across the state from Morris. The much maligned Canon 100 to 400, the old one. How many people owned that lens at one time? Get your hands all the way up. If your lens never went back for repair, you can put your hands down. Well, that's good, because I owned like three of them, and I used to beat them up badly. But I'm very rough on my gear. Yeah. But according to everyone in the world, oh, it's not sharp. It's not sharp at 400. Both Denise and I owned, used, and loved ours, our old 100 to 400s. This is at Bosque with rare clouds in the afternoon. And this was the cover of Light on, oh, excuse me, wrong book. This was the cover of Return to Wild America by my friend Scott Wiedensall, uh, the wraparound cover art. And it's a great lens for framing the blast-offs at Bosky. And one of the things we'll be teaching in another month and a couple of weeks is always look for the clean lower edge to give your images a base, your blast-off photographs at Bosky. And of course, having the ability to zoom into 400, your basic Kodak uh, tip, zoom in on what's important. Here's a researcher banding of Western Sandpiper up in Cordova, Alaska. And having the, the ability to have the 100 to 400 in my backpack, I was in uh, New Jersey on the beach in the winter with my, one, uh, with my 100 to 400 in the backpack, my 600 on the tripod over my shoulder looking for a snowy owl. And I happened upon this guy on the ridge and thought, wow, what a nice shot. Sat down, got my backpack out, took out my 100 to 400, and was able to get really nice full frame shots. So, one of the things that I liked about the lens was the versatility. But everybody says, oh, it's not sharp. It's sharp if you make a good picture. So, you know, <laughs> what does that mean? Well, I'm not trying to take a picture of the fox 8 million miles away and then crop it 
to this tiny little picture. This is full frame. That's going to make a big difference when you're using a zoom lens, something like a 100 to 400. So think about that. And so it just was a matter of just being patient, sitting down, crawling up, and letting the fox get used to us. Next. Getting a little closer, and again, having that zoom ability was really key. And in Alaska, you know, for me, I had this 600 millimeter lens, but having the 100 to 400 was great because of the versatility. As they got closer, you know, I wasn't able to frame this with a 600. I was getting headshots. So, and here from the boat in Homer, and you know, again, 100 to 400, and having that ability to zoom um, really helped. And yeah, sharp. I think that's pretty sharp. The other key is I was never really pushing the boundaries. I wasn't at exactly 400. I was pulling in just a little. So anybody who had that lens kind of knows about 350. It was a little bit better. So again, and at the Camargue in France, you know, the perfect focal length when they, the horses were first running was about 500 millimeters. But that lasted for a few seconds. So to go from a 500 on a tripod and then, you know, to something else was hard. So using a 100 to 400 was really good. And if you had a crop factor camera, you know, you really had a lot of uh, room. And in Patagonia, um, again, you know, you don't, you don't know how close they're going to get to you. They start running, and then they stand up on the um, hills and everything, and then, you know, you kind of have to get yourself in the position. So, you know, knowing your gear, knowing what your focal length was really is important because, for me, I knew exactly where I needed to be before I got there, and I knew how, you know, how to frame it. In the Galapagos, being able to get really close, but, um, you know, this guy, I loved it. And I shot this wide open because really I didn't want to see everything else. I wanted to include his foot, but I wanted his, his face and his open mouth to be what really stood out. And a lot of times as photographers, we use light, color, blur, sharpness to direct the eye. And so that's what I do. And you know, I think with a 5.6, it's easy to do that. And shooting at Nature Vision Expo, I did a, um, a couple of uh, bird workshops with the uh, raptors, the captive raptors. So um, just trying out the lens on them. That's nice. All right. The 28 to 300, I think it's still manufactured. It's a wonderful travel lens. It's a little on the heavy side. And I used it only once for one afternoon. And it was a sort of good karma deal where for years, a, an old, an elderly couple from Albuquerque kept writing me, we can't afford to take your workshops, but we want to go out with you. So she was persistent. So after about five years, I said, what are you doing on the Friday after Thanksgiving? So I said, OK, I'll take you and your husband out. So they actually came to our Thanksgiving buffet up in Albuquerque, came down to Socorro with us. And I said, hey, it looks pretty good. Let's go out now. We took them out, and as we were driving up the North Loop Road, there were huge skeins of geese flying to the north with these beautiful clouds, but everything was silent and backlit. I said, we need to get to the north end and go down half a mile and turn around and see if we can get the birds. So of course we do that, and I'm trying to go and stay within the speed limit. <laughs> and we get up there, and all the birds quit. I mean, there were like 30,000 birds in the air. And then someone was being good to me. The flocks came back. These skies like this are rare at Bosque. And I was able to zoom out to 50 millimeter focal length with a single lens. So super, super versatility. Only day I ever used it. Same with the 70 to 300. Didn't that win an award? Yeah, that was honored in uh, Nature's Best a couple of years back. Thank you. The 70 to 300 is a lighter version and really cool lens for travel again and flight, not quite the range, but makes up for it in the weight. And I used that up in Svalbard, Norway. It was a great flight lens, super quick focus. The only thing that messed with my head is that compared to the 70 to 200s, the zoom ring and the focus ring, for some reason, they reversed them, uh -huh. <laughs> which would drive you crazy if you've used the 70 to 200 for 10 years and then so what I would do is eventually I just put my hand on the zoom ring, zoom, and then start to take pictures. But again, that's a lens that I use very limited. 
the 70 to 200 28 the original is lens was a great lens i first got it when we went up to homer to do eagles used it a lot in galapagos this was in the dusk the sun is well down and there is a a newborn pup Galapagos sea lion. I want to say the name correctly so I don't get in trouble with my guide Juan. And this baby was so young that it was trying to suckle from the mother's ear. And image made at 2.8. Also from my first trip to the Galapagos, the classic blue-footed booby shot with the two eggs in a little sand nest. The old, then, then I, this is about eight years ago, 10 years ago, maybe 12. I'm going, wow, the 7200 2.8 is pretty heavy. And they came out with the 7200 F4, just a little bitty thing. And it was a great lens. I used that for a while here at St. Augustine Alligator Farm, here at, little, at uh, Fort DeSoto Park with a 40D or a 50D, and in Iceland up at, uh, oh, I remember the name the other day. Now I forgot it. No, it's a, yeah, he knows it's uh, a puff, and he's trying to think of it. Latrebjarg. The cliffs at Latrebjarg. And then, even with a little short lens, with a teleconverter, in fear of scaring the bird away with my group there, I wanted to get a head, head portrait because this guy was just sitting there posing on this beautiful little bit of grass. And I moved slowly, and I got close enough, for, zoomed out for a head portrait, made the image and then got back out of there and the bird was still sitting there, which is what you want to do. At Bosky, it was a great zoom lens. Uh, this is at the North Railroad Pond in, uh, in, in pre-dawn. And flying for one of our bear boat trips in a float plane from Kodiak to Katmai, and I was in the catbird seat next to the pilot with the 70-200 F4. And a nice flight lens at uh, San Diego on the cliffs at La Jolla. And in Galapagos, just deadly. Blue-footed, excuse me, red-footed booby nests with chicks at eye level, between eye level and waist level. 7200 F4. Birds absolutely no fear of man. Oh, must be three years ago. I was in Norway with that 70 to 300. And I got an email, and it said, a lady broke her leg. They're paid in full for the Galapagos, but they can come, and they have travel insurance. So I said, oh, man, I'll get rich. If I could sell the two spots for half price, I'll have 13000 more in my pocket. And then I said, you know what? My grandson wants to go to Galapagos. He's 12. I emailed Jennifer and said, does Sam have a passport? Yes, get him a flight, get him a, get him a ticket on this flight. And then I email my webmaster, my dear friend Peter Kess, who's been working on my blog and my website for eight years, about five years at the time. And I said, Peter, can you get from Switzerland to uh, Quito, Ecuador on Friday night? I have a free trip for you as a thank you. And he said, no, but I can be there on Thursday. So that worked out nicely. Anyway, I gave Sam a 70-200 F4 and a 50D. The kid is 12. The kid is brilliant. He was brilliant then. He's brilliant now. So this is Sam's picture made at Tandeyapa Lodge with a 70-200, one of the first images he made, not shabby. There's Sam using excellent sharpness techniques to photograph a, a, a young Galapagos tortoise. And there's a caution here for most everyone in the audience. Do not try this. <laughs> if I tried that, I'd be in the hospital for reconstructive knee surgery on my left knee. That's assuming that I could get up from that position. But I wouldn't even think of going there. So what does Sam do in this, in this situation? At a shutter speed of 1 30th of a second, he makes this picture. The kid is good. We're walking up a trail. Peter goes, oh my god, there's a, there's a uh, short-eared owl at the top of Prince Philip steps. 
Everybody took a turn. Guess who got the, the best picture? Sam. Sam. A beautiful penguin just posing as we move the zodiac back and forth. Who got the best picture? Sam. I mean, I gave him a little exposure coach, he put him in AV mode, and he went from there. And then everybody's heard that the 40D and the 50D were no good for flight. 12 years old. Way to go, Sam. Then they came out with the 7202, way sharper, sharper with the 1.4, sharper with the 2X. And both Denise and I have owned it and used it for quite a while. Yeah, this is from Iceland. Um, you know, I really like the 70 to 200, the new 70 to 200. I had the older one, and I never really put it together with the teleconverters. I never really had that much luck with it. But the new one with the newer teleconverters works really well. So a lot of times I've got my 2X on my 70 to 200, and I'm able to go out and just take that out and have you know the, the ability to take it off if I need to, but have that reach. Um, so basically just cleaning and shooting and the horses so you know some of these in Iceland some of the horses are they're all over the roads by the way just drive but some of them have these means that are just incredible and so trying to find those you know those horses you know these these two are shaking their head yes they've been there uh, but you see something like this and you go oh my gosh but having the versatility of you know of the zoom is really important and if you've ever been to the Everglades, I know, Buddy, you've been there. <laughs> um, these cormorants are basically right in your face. So a 70 to 200 is more than enough focal length. And uh, in the Palouse, one of the uh, old farms that we went to, we are photographing this old car. And the guy, Artie, went and told him, I don't know why, but he told him that I shoot flowers. And the guy said, come around the back. And walking around the back of this old rusty barn, and he has this beautiful garden of irises that were just drop dead gorgeous. And he said, I'll let you photograph, but don't bring your group back. Because he said, I don't want everybody messing up my, my flowers. So beautiful. And having a 70 to 200, I thought, oh, no. But yeah, I was really happy. Nickerson Beach in Long Island, New York, if you've been out there for skimmers, um, they do the battles. And using a, you know, a 72 or um, something with a crop factor was really good. So along with the 7, 70 to 200 with a 2x and a crop factor body, I had enough focal length to get that. <coughs> and in Iceland, I mean, these lakes were just beautiful and the reflections were great. I didn't actually see the bird. I didn't time that. So I didn't see the bird, but when I got back, I said, oh, the bird, that's nice. It's an Arctic term. Serendipity. Yes. And in Florida, being very close. So just with a straight 7200 and uh, just being close enough. And that was just a matter of two of the sandhill cranes preening and just allowing me to get closer and closer. And you know, I did that just slowly. And by the time I got, you know, to this picture, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm like almost on top of them. You get caught up in your photography and don't even realize it. One of the principles that we teach when you're photographing preening birds is that you clearly see the bird's eye and that the bird's face is perfectly parallel to the, to the back of the camera, to the imaging sensor. And Denise has both, done both of those here. Once in a great while, you get a picture that violates either of those two principles that work. But 99.9% .9 of the time, you need a good look at the eye, and you need the face dead parallel. The bird is even obliged. Denise is probably standing just slightly above the bird, and the bird's head is angled slightly away from her, making it perfectly parallel. And in Bosque del Apache, um, just being at the crane pools and having you know, the opportunity to get several birds instead of just a single bird. And oh. I got to tell this story. Go ahead. This is Denise's, <laughs> and I'm so jealous. I had the 502, the 72, and a 1.4 teleconverter. We were surrounded by humpbacks, but they were all pretty far away. And we were on a boat called Discovery on the inside passage. And then all of a sudden, there's a humpback at about 40 yards coming right at the ship, at, right at the, the bow of the Discovery. And Denise, the intrepid inside passage explorer, says, it's going to hit the boat. And the entire crew was there, and they said, they never hit the boat. 
<laughs> and amazing, I mean, I was dead in the water with a giant long focal length, and I have no idea how Denise focused and framed and got this amazing shot of the whale's tail as it hit the boat. And I did a blog post called Moment of Impact, though she did. Absolutely astounding. Yeah. Any additional lucky. comments? No, you told the story well. <laughs> Good. I love the 7200 Abaski, sometimes with the 1.4, sometimes with the crop factor camera like the 72. Well, Great. So he's doing a blast off, and what's really nice about working with something like a 70 to 200 or a 100 to 400 is you're going to get some of the background, and then that tells you that you're at Bosky. So some, sometimes, you know, including the background in some of these great locations is really important. A lot of people zero in and just get just the flock, you know, and you fill the, the edges frame to frame, and that's good too, but you also want to get a sense of where you are, and for this, that works really well. Same lens, scenic on our amazing snow day a couple of, a couple of years back, 70 to 200. And at Bridal Veil, so don't think of 70 to 200 as only wildlife lenses. They're amazing for scenics. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Mammoth Hot Springs. And a geyser, anybody know the name in Yellowstone? No, not Old not Faithful. Faithful. It's another one, Moon something. It's anyway. White something. Beautiful skies. And we had a bison dust bathing, 70 to 200, 1.4 teleconverter, Mark IV. And it was so beautiful. The thing was dust bathing like a maniac. And I took about 100 frames. This was the only one that you saw the bison. The rest was just a big cloud of black dust and dirt. Yeah. Torres del Piney. Did I say that right? Yes. I always say Piney del Taurus in Chile. And Hokkaido, Japan in winter. We, we've been doing every year uh, Japan in winter. We'll see some more photographs from that during the day. In San Diego, on my last visit in January, I went to see a, uh, an exercise kinesiologist, acupuncture guy up in Santa Ana. And on the way down, I pulled over and took a nap. I was tired. I had gotten up to photograph the pelicans in the morning. Woke up, started driving, came around a curve. All of a sudden, the whole world was orange and red and yellow. And I said, oh my god, there's fog at sunset. So I said, should I go down to the ocean? Nah, it'll fade. I drive for 10 more minutes. It keeps getting brighter and brighter. Gee, should I drive down to the ocean now? Oh, it'll fade. It's too late. Another 10 minutes. It's still getting brighter. I'm going, oh my god. Then I see the most beautiful sign. Viewpoint, one mile. Got the 70 to 200 and then did some horizontal pan blurs. By the way, I'm not sure if everybody, the pictures look the way they should on the side. If you want to take a glance over there with the lights, they're a little bit faded here. And if you go to places with time, tame wildlife, 70 to 200 and a 72 at Fort DeSoto Marble Godwit. Long Bill Curlew at Morrow Bay, and again, having that ability to zoom out. And here I probably went one shot AF or rear focus and recompose uh, to get the composition I wanted. Yeah, and let's talk about that composition. I really like that he has a small little bird and he put it in the corner. So it kind of accentuates the fact that that's a small little bird. And um, sometimes I do that and I think it's pretty effective. So just push them into the corner sometimes works really well. Go ahead. My rule is, <laughs> I write often. When doing verticals, it's great to put the bird in the middle of the frame from top to bottom, maybe a little bit closer to the bottom, maybe a little bit back in the frame. But that only works when you're half the frame or larger with the bird. The last thing you want to do with a small in the frame subject is put the bird in the middle. So when you have beautiful habitat, Think wide and get the birds tucked into one of the corners, and you can do something beautiful. Hmm. Or you can zoom in with a teleconverter. This, the rock in the foreground is actually uh, sandstone, a reddish sandstone on the cliffs of La Jolla. So I put the flash on at a very low power to give it the pelican and pink heaven. And I got low enough in the pre-dawn to get that pink sky opposite the sunrise 
on a clear day. And boy, 7,200, 2.8, killer for birds in flight at close range. This year, I outsmarted myself. I borrowed the 7,200 F4 because when we did the gannet boat on our UK puffins and gannets trip yeah. last year, within a half hour, no one could lift their 7,200, 2.8s because we were shooting constantly. And by the end of one hour, everyone quit but me. And then I needed therapy on my arm for two months. So this year, I bought the 7200 F4. Only one problem. We get there, we're sitting at, in some cafe eating lunch on our first day, and my friend Alan Lillick's cell phone rings. It's for you. What? The 80-year-old Scottish captain, Gordon, was painting the boat, and he fell off the ladder and broke his fibula and tibia in two spots. But he's recovered, so, so we wound up never going. Great for flight at close range. And you know, for the most time, I'm shooting these at f4, f5.6, even in the low light here with a good ISO. But sometimes you have no light, and you need to go to 2.8. This is in the dark on a cloudy day. What I teach for the people who come to the blog all the time, three stops off the sky, set it manually, and start taking pictures. Frigate bird landing, whoops. Sometimes we have lots of light. We can work at four or five, six. This is in the Falklands at New Island, uh, black browed albatross landing. And one of my favorite, thank you, one of my favorite images from the past year, this is at my home at Indian Lake Estates. And it's a black vulture on a rotting alligator carcass. They don't have the camera that could add the smell, <laughs> but that would have been nice. And just a matter of, I remember moving around to try to get rid of all the reflections of the trees on the far bank. And then those of you who read the blog read the story of this. We have these e spotted eagle rays right on the surface in Galapagos. So I go to the 7200 2.8, and I put the sing ray uh, circular polarizer on, and I set it to dark. And it just wasn't working. And then I saw that for some ridiculous reason, I was at f7.1. So I was giving away almost two stops of shutter speed. So I went down to 2.8, moved the sensor all the way to the left, and then I was very happy. But it was a challenge getting it right. And again, that ability to zoom out. Johnny, Ro Johnny Rook, Johnny Rook, yeah. Uh, the Caracara in the Falklands. And all those little white speckles, that's about 4,000 black-browed black albatrosses in a colony. And again, using the lower left third group of Gen 2 penguins coming in for a landing late afternoon. Mm. And a rare opportunity, I think this was at Salisbury Plain for the king penguins. You can see them in the background. We got off the Zodiac and the leaders had made a path through the dunes, and they didn't notice this northern giant petrel on a nest with a chick, or they would have picked another spot, because it was always like, oh, you can't go by them. They'll nah, nah, nah. So they get, once they saw that the birds were at ease with our presence, we were able to stand there. This is 7200 getting a little low to get the, the penguins and the, uh, the fur seals. And then from the same exact spot, zooming in with the 1.4 teleconverter, the same mess. So versatility is the key, and a Weddell seal uh, in pristine snow. This was down in Antarctica on my trip last year, a Cheeseman's trip over Christmas. An amazing scene. And here is a Gen 2 jump, jumping off an iceberg. There was somebody with a low pro. They stuck it in the water, and there was like 500 uh, Low pro or GoPro? GoPro. Oh, well. <laughs> and when we saw the pictures on video, because they stuck the thing upside down, first we were amazed that there were 500 penguins on the surface and about 4,000 in the water fishing. But the cool thing about seeing the video is because they stuck the thing in upside down, instead of the peng looking like the penguins were diving, it looks like there were rockets blasting off. It was incredible stuff. And then they built the big boy. I went to a meeting about 10 years ago 
on Long Island where I met with a bunch of other Canon explorers, including the famed Vincent Laforeo La video, who's involved in the video project they're doing. And we sat around a table with the three top Canon lens designers, and we suggested lenses. And one that I said was, man, a 200 to 400, Nikon's killing you. And that was at the time when Canon had problems with the EOS 1D Mark III. So Nikon got a big share of, mar of the market back. And then Canon, it took them a bunch of years to do it, but they did it right with the 200 to 400 with the internal extender. And I brought it down to Galapagos two years ago, blue-footed booby chicks, handheld at 560 from a Zodiac at 1 60th of a second. So the four-stop IS really is a huge improvement. Yeah. Got to look over there for this one. This is from the top of Steptoe Butte at about yeah, 4.45 in the morning on our Palouse workshops. And at 200 millimeters, just incredibly beautiful stuff. And here I'm messing around, fooling around. I'm using the 5D Mark III. I'm using HDR Art Vivid at a very slow shutter speed, slow enough so that I'm going pan, pan, pan. Three images on top of each other. And the reason I went back and forth is because just off frame left and right were farm buildings that I wanted to avoid. So that's one of the things I lo love most about digital is that you can play. You can yeah. just go out and try anything. 70, the 200 to 400 at La Jolla, able to zoom in, zoom out. I often add a teleconverter and get to 784 millimeters. Engage the teleconverter and then add an external teleconverter. How easy is this shot? Say again? How easy is this shot? Oh, this shot is not very easy because <laughs> normally you'll have 30 pelicans on the cliffs. There'll be a close range. Which one's going to do the head throw? By the time you say head throw, it's done. So you try to look for little symbols. Maybe they pull in and they're going to clean their, their bill pouch. And then they do it. And then I have a 1,000 of them where I've cut, even though I'm holding a zoom lens or even hand holding, where I've cut the bill tip or some other thing. So it's a challenge, and folks love trying to do it hey, well. Hey, how did you clip it if you had a zoom lens? Isn't that what you said to me when I was shooting? Yeah, I a, said that once, and I got yeah, in big trouble. You got in big trouble. I was shooting an osprey, and I clipped the wings. And he said, you have a zoom lens. How'd you clip, how'd you clip the wings? I said, I don't know. I forgot I had one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Universal advice for better flight and action photography with a zoom lens. Zoom wider. <laughs> but what happens? We get greedy. Oh, I want to fill the frame with the bird, and then you clip the wingtips. And that's one from this year with the 2 to 400. Went to Africa with the 602, but the 2 to 4 was way more valuable and versatile with the tremendous range from 200 all the way up to 784 with the teleconverter. Notice the good technique of getting my elbow on the, the roof of the vehicle. Oh. At 560, a little baby elephant. And boy, a pet peeve. I said to my co-leader, this guy wanted to fly a, Go a GoPro with a helicopter. I said, that's crazy. It's going to scare the elephants. Oh, no, it'll be fine. And totally, it's illegal. And the guy, and the guy does it, and 100 elephants run a while away. <laughs> and then they did the same thing the next day at the hippo pool. Serval at about 400 millimeters. And then as he approached the van, oh, I thought I had another one in there, sorry. I ended up getting headshot. But the ability to zoom out and frame the, the groupings the way you want is just incredible. And speaking of incredible, this is just a dream come true. A leopard family on a branch zoomed out to 200. 200 millimeters of sort of uh, a big crossing of wildebeests. And then zooming out again, putting those cheetahs in the lower left corner. Then I, when I'm in Africa, I want to be photographing. You've gone 22 hours on a plane, so while the rest of the group is having breakfast, I'm sitting on the ground with the 200 to 400, 
either tossing breadcrumbs or photographing the birds that are coming to the picnic area to scrounge up. Uh, that's an Usambara barbet. Canon, oh, at that lens meeting with the Canon lens designers, everybody said, you got to improve the 100 to 400. Everybody but me hated the push-pull zoom. You need to have a, a, a twist zoom, and you need to make it better sealed against us, and you need to make it sharper. So they did, and this is? Yeah, this is um, one of the first times I used the lens um, in the Palouse. I was shooting with a 70 to 200, and uh, one of my clients said, Denise, just try the 100 to 400. Trust me, you're going to love it. Put down my 70 to 200, took the 100 to 400, and said, OK, sold. <laughs> it was just that. It was wonderful. So uh, close focusing, everything, just wonderful. And using it at uh, Magnolia Gardens. Uh, just getting in close, you know, having the versatility. The 100 to 400, I never thought of it as a macro lens or being able to use it as a macro lens because the old 100 to 400 just wasn't there. This was just wonderful and sharp. So I Focuses really to inside one meter, so you can stand here and photograph your toenails. Mm -hmm. Which is nice. It's a nice feature. Oh. And the, again, that amazing versatility to zoom out and get the whole bird, and then zoom in or add a teleconverter. I use it a lot with the 1.4 teleconverter. And again, that close focus. I mean, the lens is super sharp. Anyway, I just love the 100 to 400 Do The four-stop IS is amazing. Mm. The close focus, it does great with the teleconverter. It does great with the 7D2. Little tiny Anna's hummingbird. And a medium-sized flower put on a teleconverter and move to minimum focus distance, about one meter. You know, the old 400 focused to 13 feet. The 100 to 400 to 12 feet. Now you can focus down to three feet. I mean, I haven't done dragonflies yet or frogs, but it's an ideal lens for that. And on our San Diego IPT, uh, ring neck duck in flight with the 100 to 400. So just amazing versatility. Down by the lake at my house, and I'm just futzing around in the evening, and here comes a crane flying right at me, uh, 100 to 400, and fire. At Coronado, uh, a sunset image, slow shutter speed. You've, you see that both Denise and I love blurs. Love, 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 love. Cool thing about the 7D2 for pre-dawn, pop-up flash to brighten the subject for Phil. And then the 100 to 400 at Morrow Bay uh, at sunset. Of course, trying to time the shutter release when you see birds coming in and here getting two beautiful ones flare, with a flared landing. And you know, you want to show that the birds are getting squeezed by humans, you can zoom out and get them good and squeezed. Fort DeSoto Beach with a whole bunch of willets. There's a couple of short-billed owlers and a royal turn and a laughing gull. Speaking of laughing gulls, there's one with a pipefish, 72, 100 to 400. And red-footed booby in the Galapagos. So I brought the lens down this year, a baby black neck stilt. And this is flightless cormoran. Again, focusing down close to one meter, just feather pattern. And when you do these images, you want to make sure to get f11, f13, because the curve, the problem is that depth of field is minimized as you get close to minimum focusing distance. So people don't understand that if you're looking at a bird at 30 feet in the 100 to 400, a big bird, and the bird looks sharp in the viewfinder, what you see is what you get. It's gonna, the whole bird's going to be sharp. Yet people are constantly saying, oh, i got to stop down to F8 or F11 in that situation. And all they're doing is bringing up unwanted de un background detail. So even if you're at 2.8 with a 70 to 200, if the whole bird looks sharp in the viewfinder, we have wide open viewing, it's going to be sharp on the slide. When you get close, that's where you, if you have a bird full frame with a 600, a small bird, and you're at 14 feet, 15 feet, that's where you need to start stopping down. 
And again, that close focus, just walking around on the beach in Galapagos and shooting some Sally Lightfoot crab carcasses. Oh, got to look at this one on the side screen, too. This is uh, waved albatross, the bill backlit, 7200 and a 1.4 teleconverter. The sun is above the, the lava rock, giving the backlight. And I'm just waiting for that bill to get perfectly parallel to the back of the camera, underexposing probably a third of a stop. And uh, careful framing with the, uh, the nares. You have a pointing. I know, but I don't know which one, to, which it is, the Top middle? One. Top one. <coughs> yeah, the bird's nostrils. And then, again, being a person who doesn't like to waste time, if you go to a great place, be, you want to be taking pictures. We're waiting for the zodiac. And I look down, and I see a baby Sally Lightfoot crab. Have the 100 to 400, get a fairly decent stance, go to minus a third, take a bunch of frames, and get one really sharp one. Oh. Love this one. Again, the close focus. I can't stress it enough. What a huge improvement. You can't do this with the 70 to 200. You can't do this with the, uh, the old 100 to 400. With the new one, just standing right over the uh, Galapagos Sea Lion, working at a fairly small aperture, and making a lot of pictures. My favorite. Intermediate phase red-footed booby on the nest. Here I have it on the tripod, the 100 to 400 on the tripod, probably at a 60th of a second with the 1.4 teleconverter. Here the lens alone uh, with a baby great frigate bird in Galapagos and a side-lit land iguana on our last morning at... Uh, that light's beautiful. Oh, it was, it was sweet. And that's unusual for me to be working off sun angle at all. And that was a featured image in the blog. Zooming in to get the essence, the booby chick, blue footed booby, and the adult's feet. Oh, and I stood there for an hour for this one. This close, Mars, to this uh, Nazca booby on the nest, just waiting. And I tried zone AF. And I saw that most of the time it was hitting the eye, not the bill, because I was right at minimum. And I took 100 pictures. And this one was just what I was looking for. Even at a small aperture like f11 or 10, you're not even going to come close to getting the bill in focus at minimum focus distance. I love this. It's exactly what I wanted. And when I put it on the blog, one person commented, oh, you cut off the top of his head. <laughs> and I said, thank you. <laughs> Marine iguana, again, picking your level, your perspective to get the strip of green at the top above the, uh, the animal. Mm. And a side-lit greater flamingo, 100 to 400, 72, and a 1.4 teleconverse. So I'm, I'm, I'm out there at 7 or 800 millimeters. <laughs> From the Zodiac, very effective lens. Courting Galapagos penguins came up right in front of us, just absolutely perfect from the Zodiac or the Pangas at sunset. Galapagos penguin. We, had, we were lucky last year. We had a, uh, a feeding spree of blue-footed boobies diving, Nazca booby at Darwin Bay, and a great little landscape lens. I think these are incense trees. And mud patterns focus a little past a third of the way into the frame and shoot it at f32 with my flower technique. Mirror lock, two second timer. Get your hands off it and make the picture. It's beautiful. And then I'm always looking to push the envelope. So my group was photographing on Santa Fe, no, South Plaza in the Galapagos. And all of the iguanas were sitting in the sun, except for this one that was sitting in the shade. And that's my rule. When it's real sunny, look for subjects in the shade. So I take the 2x and put it on the 100 to 400. What's the problem there? F11, no autofocus. But I'm on a tripod. This thing ain't moving. And I see that when I focus manually, not even going to live view. The eye just jumps into focus incredibly and made a whole bunch of pictures, everyone sharp, and was able to get the subject in the shade. Took the lens out to Jamaica Bay in a downpour. 
You see the rain there, 45 degrees, a bunch of semi-sands, and then a blur of my old place where all this started in 1983 when I went out with the 4.5 FD that Peter Post suggested, along with Tom Davis. At Nickerson Beach, 100 to 400 killer for flight. On our inside passage cruise where poor Denise got sicker than a dead dog with the flu. And on my bare boat picture, uh, glaucus winged and black legged kitty wakes on a rock, zoom blur, kitty wake flying, uh, blasting highlights shooting into the bright sun at about minus two stops into the reflections off the water. Then we, would, we were catching halibut and some small fish. I chop them up. We throw it out and chum in the kitty wakes. This is a young kitty wake. On Denise's Charleston workshop, a, uh, as a landscape or buildingscape lens, an old church, right? Mm -hmm. And on top of the Palouse, on top of Steptoe Butte. On our UK tour, tremendously versatile, close focus, and looking down with a nest right here, just a foot below my feet photographing baby black-legged kittiwake chicks in the nest. This is a guy I met at uh, Venice Rookery, real nice. He and his wife, Tim and Barbara, they drove around the country in a custom-built Cadillac motorhome. They had this beautiful uh, cabinet built in the back of their Escalade. They towed that. And they went around the country doing slide programs for hospitals and old age homes. So God bless them. This is how they store all their, can their gear. Then, that's the sort of anal retentive amateur way. And then, of course, is the professional way. <laughs> that's the birds as our trunk. Now you know why I don't let them touch my gear. <laughs> Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.